Okay, we'll get started with the last two sessions. Um, so, uh, Zoster Vaccines with uh, Dr. Moore giving the introduction, please. He members and especially our wonderful CDC liaison, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. As a reminder, in October 2017, the ACIP made the following recommendations. First, that recombinant zoster vaccine, shortened as RZV, is recommended for the prevention of herpes zoster for immunocompetent adults aged 50 and older. Number two, that RZV is recommended for the prevention of zoster and its related complications for immunocompetent adults who previously received zoster vaccine live or ZVL. And then third, RZV is preferred over ZVL for the prevention of herpes zoster and its complications. Its publication in 2018 uh, was a supplement to the existing recommendations for the use of ZVL in immunocompetent adults aged 60 and over. Since June of 2018, um, we have had six work group meetings, and um, listed here are the different topics that we've looked at, including uh, burden and pathophysiology in immunocompromised persons, vaccine performance in the immunocompromised, and a follow-up on post-licensure safety and uptake monitoring of RZV. Today's presentations are on preliminary results of RZV safety and uptake, and Unlike the printed agenda, we will start with Dr. Tom Shimabakuro and the safety update followed by Dr. Dooling and work group impressions. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge all of the people who've participated in the work that we're going to present today, uh, both at CDC and among our wonderful work group. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Tom Shima Bakura. I'm with the Immunization Safety Office. Uh, just to briefly um, give you some background, the recombinant zoster vaccine, which I'll refer to as RZV, is an adjuvanted glycoprotein vaccine. In clinical trials, it was reactogenic, but rates of serious adverse events were similar between RZV and placebo groups. Before I start, I'm going to introduce a few terms. This slide is mostly for reference, but I am going to talk about a few um, terms that are uh, th that we use in the context of vaccine safety monitoring and research. An adverse event is an adverse medical or health event following a vaccination, which may or may not be related to vaccination. So these are temporally associated events. An adverse reaction is an adverse health event following vaccination where substantial evidence exists to suggest the event is causally related to vaccination. So some adverse events can be adverse reactions and some adverse events can be coincidental events, temporarily associated but not related to vaccination. Uh, automated analysis is analysis on administrative or claims data or non-chart or health record confirmed data. Typically this is done in large uh, electronic health record databases using ICD codes, or in the case of VAERS using MEDRA codes, and MEDRA is used um, in, in the regulatory world extensively. A chart confirmed or med medical record confirmed case is a case where a review of medical charts and records by physicians or medical personnel confirms the diagnosis as valid and with accurate onset relative to the timing of vaccination. I'll go through some of the, I'll, I'll explain some of these others during the presentation, but finally, a statistical signal is a finding from an analysis where a calculated value exceeds a specified statistical threshold. A statistical signal does not necessarily represent a vaccine safety problem and requires further assessment before conclusions can be drawn. So today I'll be covering uh, data from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System and preliminary results from Vaccine Safety Data Link Rapid Cycle Analysis. So VAERS is our spontaneous reporting, our passive monitoring system that is co-managed by CDC and FDA. Uh, the strengths of VAERS are that it can rapidly detect safety signals and can detect rare adverse events. It's subject to the limitations of spontaneous reporting in general. Um, as I mentioned previously, we get reports of adverse events in VAERS, some of which may be true adverse reactions, 
some of which may be coincidental events and not related to vaccination. We accept all reports without judging causality or the seriousness of the event. But because of limitations, generally we cannot assess causality from VAERS data. It's a hypothesis generating system. So these are a couple of publications on post licensure safety monitoring for RZV. What I'll be presenting today for VAERS is basically an update of the publication on the right. In this case, that publication went through June 2018. We're, I'm presenting a descriptive analysis of RZV reports received October 20, 2017 through December 2018. We also calculated reporting rates based on doses distributed in the U.S. market. Our colleagues at FDA conducted em empirical Bayesian data mining to detect disproportional reporting for vaccine adverse event pairings. And we clinically reviewed reports, including medical records when available for 22 pre-specified outcomes. Here's a listing of those outcomes in alphabetical order. So during the analytic period, we received 14,381 reports following RZV. 97.6 uh, of those were classified as non-serious. Based on 8.59 million doses distributed during this period, the reporting rate for all reports was 167 per 100,000 doses distributed, and for serious reports, four per 100,000 doses distributed. Those rates are similar to what we see for other vaccines administered in this age group. A serious report is uh, defined by the Code of Fe Federal Regulations. That's um, death, life-threatening illness, hospitalization, or prolongation of hospitalization or permanent disability. Again, these are reports occurring in temporal association, and we're not making any judgment on causality. Systemic signs and symptoms and injection site reactions were the most commonly reported adverse events, and there were no unexpected patterns detected by physician reviewers of reports of the 22 pre-specified outcomes. Empirical Bayesian data mining detected one finding that was product administered to a patient of inappropriate age when looking at individuals 19 to 44.9 years old and RZV is not approved for use in this age group. So in summary, RZV post-licensure safety monitoring findings and VAERS are generally consistent with the safety profile observed in pre-licensure clinical trials. Self-limited systemic signs and symptoms and injection site reactions were the most commonly reported adverse events. Serious adverse, adverse events were rarely reported, 2.4% of reports, which is similar to other vaccines given in the same age group. And there were no empirical Bayesian data mining findings for any RZV adverse event pairings except for product administered to a patient of inappropriate age. So now I'll move to vaccine safety data link rapid cycle analysis for RZV. The VSD is a collaboration between CDC and several integrated healthcare plans. It's a large link database that we use for surveillance and research. Vaccination records, health outcomes, and patient characteristics are linked by unique patient IDs. A bit on rapid cycle analysis. It's a powerful and sophisticated tool for near real-time safety monitoring. It's a surveillance activity, which is not the same as an epidemiologic study. It requires careful thought and customization in the design, setup, and interpretation. It employs an automated analysis that uses ICD-10 coded diagnoses from claims data. It's designed to detect statistical signals, which again are values above specified statistical thresholds. Not all statistical signals represent a true increase, increase in a risk for an adverse event. When a statistical signal occurs, CDC conducts a series of evaluations using traditional epidemiologic methods. And chart confirmation of diagnoses to confirm or exclude cases as true incident cases is a key part of statistical assessment. The primary analysis for RZV RCA is a historical comparator design. We're doing monthly near real-time sequential monitoring of pre-specified outcomes. We're gonna do 18 planned monthly analyses, which started um, at six months um, after January, with an 18-week data lag 
This data lag uh, uh, accounts for the, the, um, the risk windows plus time to let the data settle and mature. It's an automated analysis, as I mentioned previously, using ICD-10 or nine code, ICD-9 codes, depending on the dates. The third analysis has been completed, and the test statistic is an adjusted likelihood ratio test. So this is a schematic. So for this current versus historical design, I don't know if you can see this, but we're basically looking at ICD-9 coded outcomes, events, in the risk window for current RZV recipients compared to the same outcomes in the same risk window in a historical comparator. And these are ZBL recipients from 2013 to 2017. So we're just comparing observed events in, in one risk window for the current recipients compared to what we expect based on the uh, historical ZVL recipients. We have 10 high priority pre-specified outcomes listed here. We also have other outcomes for descriptive analysis only. You can see in the footnote there. These outcomes are based on outcomes of historical concern for vaccine safety plus um, uh, outcomes that um, were described in the uh, pre-licensure submissions to FDA plus outcomes um, that we monitored for Zostavax as well. Secondary analyses for RZV, RCA, and the VSD also uses two concurrent comparators. Those are individuals that had an ICD-10 coded well visit during the RZV uptake period or received some other vaccine during the RZV uptake period. So the current analysis, the third analysis, for this analysis, we have roughly 106,000 doses administered through August 2018, with follow-up for outcomes through December 2018. And this is the table um, of the, the RCA results. As you can see, for the high-priority outcomes, um, the first nine of them, um, there was no preliminary statistical signals, no evidence of an increased risk. We did have one preliminary statistical signal for Guillain-Barre syndrome. We actually detected that statistical signal during the second analysis, but I'm showing you data for the third analysis. And in this analysis, we have four observed events in the risk interval compared to 0.8 expected events. That's a relative risk of 5.06 and the likelihood ratio exceeded the critical value, so we have a statistical signal. So one of the first steps we take when we have a statistical signal is to conduct a rapid assessment, and uh, one of the major activities is to review those cases in the VSD. So here's a table with the uh, short chart review of automated cases, and short chart review is not the full clinical narrative, it's basically an abbreviated review where we've extracted key data that allow us to do a rapid assessment of the cases. So I won't spend much time on the first two cases. Those are individuals with a history of GBS diagnosed years prior. There's no recurrence or exacerbation after RZV. So these are called historical cases. They are not true incident cases. An incident case is a case that is either new in general or a new onset during your specified time period where you're looking. These cases were diagnosed years in the past, and then they appeared because there was some type of health encounter um, after vaccination where this was captured in the VSD database. Then there was, uh, moving down, there's a 68-year-old female who received concurrent PCV13 and had ZVL seven years prior and GBS symptom onset 13 days post-vaccination and was hospitalized 15 days post-vaccination. A short chart review confirmed this case, and it was classified as Brighton criteria level two. Brighton is a standardized case definition that we use uh, in vaccine safety. One is the highest level of diagnostic certainty. The next case was a 59-year-old female who received concurrent hepatitis B vaccination and had chart documented GBS onset no later than one day post-vaccination but the symptoms may have started prior to vaccination. The patient had some signs and symptoms in the month prior and in the days leading up to vaccination, 
suggestive of, of an infection, such as respiratory and GI symptoms. This was adjudicated as a short chart review confirmed case, Brighton criteria level one, but the actual GBS symptom onset was uncertain. So after the initial chart review of these four cases, uh, two ruled out, one appears to be a confirmed case in the risk window, Brighton level two. And I wanna emphasize that a case in the risk window um, it does not equate to a causally associated case. It means there was a vaccination and then a case in the risk window, it fell within this window of biological plausibility. The last case um, is a confirmed case, Brighton criteria level one, but is, is questionable because the actual GBS symptom onset is uncertain. And also, even if it was one day, that's a pretty short onset after an exposure um, for Guillain-Barre syndrome. We're conservative in that one to 42 day interval. So in summary, after the third analysis of 18 plan, we have 106,000 doses of RZV administered in the VSD from January through August 2018. There's no evidence of an increased risk for any of the pre-specified outcomes except GBS, and this was in the automated ICD-10 nine code analyses. We detected a statistical signal for GBS in the primary analysis and consistently elevated relative risks across the other comparators. So that's the well visit comparator and the receive some other vaccine comparator. Full clinical narratives have been requested for review for the two valid GBS cases. We plan to also chart review the GBS cases following ZVL in the historical comparator group. That's how we generate our expected values. So part of the signal assessment was to also go back and re-review the VAERS reports for GBS. So we had 35 reports that had a MEDRA preferred term of GBS assigned. And upon review, 19 case reports met Brighton criteria for GBS, either level one, level two, or level three. Six case reports did not meet Brighton criteria or had insufficient information, but were explicitly described as physician diagnosed GBS. And the remaining case reports did not meet Brighton criteria or not physician diagnosed. So of these 25 cases that met Brighton criteria or were physician diagnosed, that's the 19 plus six, 24 had symptom onset within a zero to 42 day risk window following RZV. And that translates into a reporting rate of 2.8 cases per million doses distributed. We also did some proportional reporting ratio analysis. This is similar to FDA's empirical Bayesian data mining and that you're looking for disproportionality or disproportional reporting. We looked at compared to groups of specific vaccines, and we did not detect any disproportional reporting for RZB GBS when either zoster vaccine live, flu vaccine, or pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccines were used as comparators. So as far as next steps, FDA is exploring options for an analysis of GBS following RZB in the CMS database. CDC will continue to monitor this preliminary VSD RCA statistical signal for GBS, and CDC will continue enhanced monitoring for RZV and VAERS to include clinical review of all GBS reports following RZV. This is a timeline um, of events. Uh, it's mostly for reference, but the, I think a point to emphasize here is um, this signal was, uh, was detected, rapidly evaluated, we engaged our colleagues in the immunization program. We notified FDA. Um, we also engaged the ACIP Zoster work group. We presented them to them twice in, Febu in February, and here we are on the 28th presenting um, at the public meeting. Some closing thoughts. We're still in the initial uptake period for RZV and early in the post-licensure monitoring process. Overall, the safety profile of RZV is consistent with pre-licensure clinical trial data. The VAERS data indicate that systemic reactions and local reactions are commonly reported. There are no um, safety signals for any other events. Um, a limited number of doses have been administered in the VSD at this point. A statistical signal was detected based on a small number of cases using automated data. There's three ICD-10 coded GBS cases, currently four. Upon review, we have one confirmed case in the risk window, one questionable, two have ruled out. Our post-licensure monitoring systems and surveillance methods are designed to be rapid, sensitive, and to allow for quick assessment of statistical signals. 
Our policy is to be transparent and to communicate vaccine safety information in a timely manner. These preliminary data are insufficient to conclude that a safety problem exists for GBS, but further evaluation and continued vigilance is warranted. The RZV GBS statistical signal detection and assessment demonstrates the robust and responsive US vaccine safety monitoring system in action, working as intended. And finally, CDC will update the Zoster work group as information becomes available and will be available to update the ACIP as requested. I'd like to acknowledge the following individuals. And I believe we're taking questions at the end. Good afternoon, everyone. During the ACIP meeting in June 2018, I showed a table summarizing CDC's plan for monitoring recombinant zoster vaccine coverage, uptake, and two-dose series completion. Today, we'll present preliminary data from three of those systems. First, I'll present data from the immunization information systems in six jurisdictions, and then I'll present a vaccine administrative claims data from Medicare beneficiaries in CMS. Dr. Shima Bakuru briefly presented recombinant zoster vaccine uptake within the vaccine safety data link during his presentation. And the survey data for 2018 are not yet available and those will be presented at a future meeting. First, preliminary results for recombinant zoster vaccine uptake in immunization information systems, hereafter referred to as IIS. The observation period for this analysis was October 2017 through the end of 2018. Data was contributed from six jurisdictions, Minnesota, Michigan, Oregon, North Dakota, Wisconsin, and New York City. The inclusion criteria for analysis presented here was age 50 years and older and a record of at least one recombinant zoster vaccine dose uh, within the IIS during the observation period. Data were pulled between uh, February 7th and 14th of this year, and the data are dynamic. In other words, reports may still be received within the system. The analysis was provided by the IIS Sentinel site awardees in each jurisdiction. This table shows the age of persons who received doses of recombinant zoster vaccine recorded in IIS. There were just over 750,000 doses recorded during this time. 21% of those doses were administered uh, to people in their 50s, 41%, the largest share, were administered to people in their 60s, and 28% and 11% to people in their 70s and 80s. This graph shows the number of recombinant zoster vaccine doses recorded in IIS by month from October 2017 through December 2018. The doses administered increased sharply in March and April. After that, between approximately 60,000 and 100,000 doses were administered each month in these settings. This graph depicts the proportion of recombinant zoster vaccine administered in pharmacy versus non-pharmacy settings. For people in their 50s, a minority were vaccinated in a pharmacy. That proportion increases to 54% for people in their 60s, and for those 70 and older, a full 70% were vaccinated in a pharmacy. It should be noted that these estimates varied substantially by state, uh, ranging from 28% overall in one jurisdiction to 85% in another. However, in all jurisdictions, older age was associated with increased chance of being vaccinated in a pharmacy setting. Now I'll present results for zoster vaccine uptake among Medicare beneficiaries. Similarly to the previous analysis I showed, the observation period was October 2017 through December 2018. The inclusion criteria for beneficiaries was this, that they had to age into Medicare by October 2017 and that they were continuously enrolled in Medicare Part D up until their vaccination date. Data were pulled during February 13th, 14th of this year, and the data are dynamic. This analysis was provided by Acumen through a collaboration with FDA, CMS, and CDC. This table shows the characteristics of Medicare beneficiaries who received at least one dose of recombinant zoster vaccine. In this analysis, over 1.5 million beneficiaries were vaccinated with recombinant zoster vaccine under Medicare Part D. The mean age was 75 years old, and the vast majority of vaccinees were younger than 80. 59% of vaccinees were female. 
This graph shows the number of zoster vaccine live and recombinant zoster vaccine doses administered to Medicare beneficiaries by month from October 2017 through December 2018. Zoster vaccine live, shown here in black, administration declines towards the end of uh, 2017, and first dose of recombinant zoster vaccine begins to rise steeply in March and April, with second dose increasing three months later in June and July. Here, data for the cumulative number of recombinant zoster vaccine uh, doses is presented. As mentioned, just over 1.5 million beneficiaries received the first dose, depicted in blue, and over 750,000 received a second dose during the same time period. As you know, the second dose of recombinant zoster vaccine is recommended two to six months following the first dose. This table shows recombinant zoster vaccine series completion and timing of the second dose for Medicare beneficiaries vaccinated in 2018. You can see the number of first doses that occurred each month. Subsequent columns show how many of those individuals got a second dose by two, three, six, and nine months later. As you can see in the highlighted box, uh, for beneficiaries for whom at least six months had elapsed, at least 75% of them received the second dose. This is strong series completion despite challenges with shortages of recombinant zoster vaccine. It also must be taken into account though that these Medicare beneficiaries are highly motivated vaccine seekers uh, who received the first dose within the first five months of CDC recommendations when the vaccine supply was really just becoming available. Moving on now to recombinant zoster vaccine supply status. GSK plans to manage supply by continuing ordering limits during 2019. Therefore, providers will continue to experience shipping delays. In response to demand for the vaccine during 2018, GSK has taken the following steps. More frequent uh, uh, increased number of doses available for the U.S. market in the second half of 2018 and planned more frequent higher volume shipments to increase supply and delivery doses more consistently for all customer types in 2019. In conclusion, the following points summarize the herpes zoster work group discussions. That recombinant zoster vaccine demand continues to outpace supply. Approximately 8.59 million doses were distributed in the U.S. through 2018, and a greater number of doses are expected in 2019. The two-dose recombinant zoster vaccine series completion within six months is greater than 75% among Medicare beneficiaries. While this is strong series completion, we, continue, we need to continue monitoring the, as supply stabilizes and immunization providers can expand their reach beyond the most highly motivated vaccinees. A preliminary statistical signal for GBS among recombinant zoster vaccine recipients has been observed based on four claims in administrative data. Because claims data are not medical records, they require verification and investigation. In fact, in a brief chart review, it was confirmed that onset of GBS predated receipt of recombinant zoster vaccine in two cases. The herpes zoster workgroup agreed that there is insufficient evidence at this time to support a change in policy or practice. More investigation is required to determine whether this statistical signal is or is not a safety problem. In order to do that, clinical validation is necessary and is underway, as well as evaluation of near real-time data in other surveillance systems, also underway. The herpes zoster workgroup will be updated on each of these steps as soon as information becomes available. The workgroup commits to reporting uh, interpretation of that data to the ACIP at the earliest opportunity. Thank you, and with that, I'll turn over uh, the, to questions. Thank you very much. So. Um, Dr. Friedland from uh, GSK is going to offer some comment. Uh, thank you very much, Leonard Friedland from GSK Vaccines Medical Affairs. Just want to say that, of course, GSK's top priority is patient safety, and we are committed to monitoring and assuring the safety of all of our products, including, of course, Shingrix. GSK recognizes the importance of the vaccine safety link data and a comprehensive review of preclinical studies, clinical trials, and post-marketing reports to GSK 
has not indicated an increased occurrence of GBS following vaccination with Shingrix. Now, GSK remains confident in the favorable benefit risk profile of Shingrix for the prevention of herpes zoster, and GSK will continue to work closely with the CDC and the FDA to actively monitor the safety of Shingrix. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody from the, Paul? Yeah, sorry, Dr. Hunter. That's okay. Um, I just had a question about uh, the um, BSD uh, definition of when the risk uh, window started uh, for RZV. Was it with the first dose or the second dose of RZV? These are all, these are all first dose. The cases were all first dose. I mean, not not every. We're looking at dose one and dose two, separate. I mean, separate risk windows. But I will just say for this analysis, these four cases were after first dose. Dr. Bernstein, I'm assuming that the hepatitis B vaccine was not the new adjuvanted Heplisav that was given with the uh, Shingrix adjuvanted vaccine. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to check on that. I would say that there is very limited use of the new Heplosav vaccine, except in one site that's doing a post-marketing study for the manufacturer. Yeah, I just was wondering, since it's not recommended, I guess, giving two adjuvanted vaccines at this point is what I understood. I don't know if that's the... I don't know if that's the recommendation, but I, I, I don't I, I don't have uh, information on that particular vaccine, but we can certainly look at that. I think there's no data. I'm not saying yeah. that, that, that I, I phrased that wrong. My understanding is there's no data for giving the two adjuvanted vaccines at the same time. Thank you for the presentation on the safety issues and your continuing evaluation of them. I am curious regarding the evaluation of other vaccines beyond Hep B that may be given at or near that same time. Well, we monitor, we, we monitor, we do rapid cycle analysis for influenza vaccine each season. So, uh, is specifically, if you're talking about co-administration, we, we certainly document that, but we're not specifically monitoring on co-administration. Um, but we do we do monitor influenza vaccine very intensively each um, each season. We're we're monitoring uh, we're monitoring Shingrix vaccine, and and we we have a period of intense enhanced monitoring after any newly licensed and recommended vaccine. And, uh, and we will, when we can capture information on co-administration, we do. I will say in VAERS, that is one of the priority, let me go back to the, oh, that's, so if those 22 pre-specified conditions, co-administration is not really a condition, but that we classify that as a condition. So any, any time RZV is ministered with adjuvanted influenza vaccine, adjuvanted, uh, the the the, hep, the new hepatitis B vaccine or all three together we will we will we will review those reports regardless of seriousness. And just to clarify, though, in the GBS cases, you have not flagged that as an issue. Well, the two the two um, cases had co-administration. One I think had uh, one had PCV and the other had uh, hepatitis B vaccine. But we haven't specifically flagged co-administration in our monitoring overall as problematic. Um, but in those two cases, there was co-administration. Thank you. I appreciate the information. Any other questions from the committee? Comments from the liaisons? Thank you very much for the presentations. Sorry. What? Oh, yeah. So um, next we'll move on to hepatitis vaccines. <clears throat> with an introduction by Dr. Moore again. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome to our last session of the day. 
The ACIP hepatitis work group terms of reference are to focus on hepatitis A at the moment with an with a focus on updating the a- hepatitis A recommendations that were last co- comprehensively published in 2006. We also are charged with looking at persons living with HIV as a risk group for hepatitis A vaccination. We've had a busy season since our last meeting in October with two ACIP publications uh, coming out in the MMWR, our recommendations for the use of hepatitis A vaccine in persons experiencing homelessness, as well as our updated recommendations for the use of vaccine for post-exposure prophylaxis and for international travel. Since our last meeting, we've had four meetings focused on HIV as an indication for vaccination. And we have applied the evidence to recommendation framework and grade. Today's session, we're going to talk about persons living with HIV as a risk group for hepatitis A vaccination uh, with a vote at a future meeting. I want to set the stage a bit for this discussion. And you may be asking, why should persons living with HIV be considered for routine hepatitis A vaccination, since HIV infection alone does not increase the risk of exposure to hepatitis A, nor does it necessarily lead to more severe disease. However, studies suggest that hepatitis A virus infection increases HIV replication in persons who are living with HIV. Studies also suggest that HIV infection delays hepatitis A virus infection resolution, which may lead to a longer period of transmissibility. Studies also suggest that people with HIV can mount a protective antibody response to vaccination, although that protection may be less robust. Our next steps for the working group include presenting the full updated hepatitis A vaccine statement for a vote, and then to continue deliberations on adult hepatitis B vaccination topics. I want to thank the participating work group members, um, especially my fellow members on the committee and our lead, Noelle Nelson, and her team for all the great work they've been doing. Also, we've had a lot of wonderful contributions from people across CDC and other members of the work group. And I want to acknowledge the Tennessee Department of Health for sharing with us their experience with HIV-infected persons who've acquired hepatitis A in the recent multi-state outbreak. Thank you. So next, we're going to hear from Dr. Wing regarding background of hepatitis A vaccines in persons with HIV infection. Thank you, Kelly. Good afternoon, everybody. Here I'm going to present background information on hepatitis A epidemiology, hepatitis A vaccines, hepatitis A virus ongoing outbreaks, including a small case study from, from Tennessee and provide some statistics on HIV in the US. In 2016, there were 2007 reported cases. However, we know that the reported cases will be much higher in 2017 and 2018 due to the ongoing hepatitis A virus outbreaks in multiple states among people who use drugs and people experiencing homelessness. When comparing the 2016 hepatitis A rates for all age groups, Adults aged 20 to 49 years had the highest rates per 100,000 population. Overall, data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES, show the prevalence of antibody among U.S. residents is about 26.5%, indicating that less than a third of the U.S. population had protection against hepatitis A virus infection in 2009 to 2010. The lowest percentages of protection were among adults aged 30 to 49 years. Groups at increased risk of hepatitis A virus infection or severe hepatitis A disease are recommended to receive hep A vaccine. The recommended groups to receive hep A vaccine and year of recommendation are shown here. Today, we will discuss work group deliberations, grade, and evidence to recommendation framework regarding HIV as a risk group for hepatitis A vaccination. Today's presentation regarding HIV and hep A vaccination will focus on adults since children are recommended for hep A vaccination as part of the routine childhood vaccination schedule at age 12 to 23 months, or as part of permissive catch-up vaccination. During licensing trials, it was found that hep A vaccines licensed in the US are highly immunogenic, immunocompetent persons aged greater than 18 years, 
when administered according to recommended schedules. Protective antibody levels were identified in 94 to 100 percent of immunocompetent adults one month after the first dose. After the second dose, all immunocompetent persons had protective levels of antibody with high geometric mean titers, or GMTs. In pre-licensure trials, adverse reactions to Fabrix, Bacta, and Twinwix were mostly injection site reactions and mild systemic reactions. Post-marketing surveillance for adverse events following receipt of Hep A vaccines has been performed primarily by two systems in the U.S., VAERS and VSD, which we've just heard about. No unusual or unexpected safety patterns were observed for any of the Hep A vaccines licensed in the U.S. More information on vaccine safety will be presented as part of the following presentation on GRADE. Immunogenicity. The antibody to hepatitis A virus has been shown to persist in vaccine recipients for at least 20 years in immunocompetent adults administered inactivated vaccine as children with a three-dose schedule. At least 20-year antibody to hepatitis A virus persistence was demonstrated among immunocompetent adults vaccinated with a two-dose schedule as adults. Detectable antibodies are estimated to persist for 40 years or longer based on mathematical modeling and antibody to hepatitis A virus kinetic studies. Protection following natural infection is lifelong and may also be lifelong following vaccination. For persons with immunocompromising conditions or comorbidities, protection may be less. In adults, the greater or equal to two dose vaccine coverage was much lower than in children and adolescents in 2016. 9.5% for adults greater or equal to 19 years, 13.4% for adults 19 to 49 years, 5.4% for adults greater or equal to 50 years. When considering recommended risk groups for Hep A vaccination, for adults aged 19 to 49 years, greater or equal to two dose vaccine coverage was 19% for travelers and 24% for persons with chronic liver disease. The epidemiology for hepatitis A has shifted. In the past, large community outbreaks were associated with asymptomatic children infecting the adults who cared for them, who then transmitted the virus to other adults. With widespread adoption of the universal childhood vaccination recommendations, asymptomatic children are no longer the main drivers of outbreak. As shown on the previous slides, although the overall incidence rate of hepatitis A virus infection has decreased within all age groups, most adults are not immune because they haven't been vaccinated or were not infected naturally. Older people are more likely to be symptomatic and experience severe disease and adverse outcomes such as hospitalization, fulminant liver disease, fulminant liver failure, and death. For the at-risk adult for which vaccination recommendations do exist, uptake is low. As shown in this curve of reported outbreak cases, the number of cases has risen sharply since 2015. Person-to-person -person transmission is currently the most common source of hepatitis A virus transmission in the ongoing outbreak. Hepatitis A out virus outbreaks have been ongoing in multiple states among people who use drugs and or people experiencing homelessness, as well as continued reports of MSM cases. Since these outbreaks were first identified in 2016, more than 13,000 cases and 7,400 hospitalizations have been reported for a 57% hospitalization rate. Over 100 deaths have occurred nationwide because of these outbreaks. Hospitalization rates have, have been higher than typically associated with hepatitis A infection, probably reflective of more serious illness among the vulnerable populations impacted by these outbreaks. Hepatitis A virus is highly transmissible from person to person, and so prolonged community outbreaks have been challenging to control. This map shows in blue the 17 states that have been or are affected by the person-to-person -person hepatitis A outbreaks. During the course of the outbreak, multiple states reported cases among persons living with HIV who had a history of unknown or at least partial hepatitis A vaccination. These reports prompted us to request case reports from affected states and to perform a systematic review to investigate the risk of hepatitis A virus infection, course of infection, and to evaluate the response to hepatitis A vaccine among persons living with HIV. Complete case information was not available from all states. We will provide data from the Tennessee Department of Health today. In Tennessee, 14 persons living with HIV were infected with hepatitis A virus. Five of the 14, or 36%, were previously vaccinated with at least one dose of either combination or single antigen 
hepatitis A vaccine at least one month prior to hepatitis exposure. Eight had no or unknown vaccination history. 13 out of 14 or 93% had an indication for hep A vaccine prior to becoming ill with hepatitis A virus. Previously vaccinated hepatitis A virus cases among persons living with HIV raised concern about susceptibility to hepatitis A virus among persons living with HIV and hep A vaccine long-term immunogenicity. These data represent missed opportunities for vaccination among persons with an existing recommended risk factor of vaccination, up to eight patients or 57%, and potential waning immunity among persons previously vaccinated, up to 43%. We will use the definition of HIV infection as follows. The term refers to persons diagnosed with HIV infection, regardless of the stage of disease at diagnosis from all 50 states, DC, and six US dependent areas. At the end of 2015, an estimated prevalence of 1.1 million people greater or equal to 13 years old were living with HIV infection, including 162,500 people, 14.5%, whose HIV infection had not been diagnosed. In 2017, the number of new HIV diagnoses was 38,739 and was mostly among adults. The highest numbers were among ages 20 to 39. CDC classifies HIV diagnoses into six transmission categories to which transmission may be attributed. The categories shown in red, smaller, represent existing recommended risk groups for hep A vaccination. Based on this classification, approximately 24% of persons living with HIV do not have another risk, fact, risk group for which hep A vaccination is recommended. We use the Medical Monitoring Project, or MMP, which looks at a nationally representative sample of persons living with HIV to answer the question, what percentage of persons living with HIV do not have an existing risk factor for which hep A vaccine is recommended? The percentage of persons living with HIV without a recommended risk group for hep A vaccination is higher when looking at more specific risk factor data. MMP includes the following risk groups for which hep A vaccination is recommended. MSM, injection and non-injection drug use, persons experiencing homelessness, chronic liver disease, and clotting factor disorder. Up to 40% of persons did not have a risk factor for which hep A vaccination is recommended. Some risk factors for which hep A vaccine is recommended could not be evaluated, such as occupational risk, travel risk, or exposure to an international adoptee from an endemic country. However, this slide illustrates that persons living with HIV might be missed for hep A vaccination if they don't have an existing risk factor for which hep A vaccine is recommended or they don't seek services for the other risk factors. In summary, hep A vaccine is largely responsible for the marked reduction in hepatitis A cases. Increasing proportion of adults in the US are susceptible to hepatitis A due to reduced exposure to hepatitis A early in life Significant decreases in seroprevalence of anti-hepatitis A virus antibody in older adults, and because low two-dose vaccination coverage exists in adults, including high-risk adults such as travelers or those with chronic liver disease. The ongoing hepatitis A outbreaks illustrate the shifting epidemiology and person-to-person -person transmission among unvaccinated, vulnerable populations. About 1 million persons are living with HIV in the U.S. And finally, up to 40% of persons living with HIV do not have a risk factor for which hep A vaccination is otherwise recommended. Now, Alia will present the grade portion of this presentation. Thank you, Mark. I will be presenting on grade for hepatitis A vaccine among persons living with HIV infection. This slide shows an overview of the grade process. The darker bullets are the components followed by the work group for evaluation of hepatitis A vaccine for persons living with HIV. The policy question for consideration is, should a routine two-dose vac vaccination versus no routine vaccination to prevent hepatitis A be given to adult HIV-positive persons, regardless of another indication for vaccination? Our population of interest is adult HIV-positive persons, regardless of another indication for vaccination. Our intervention of interest is routine two-dose hepatitis A vaccination. And our comparison of interest is no routine two-dose hepatitis A vaccination. 
The outcomes of work group considered were hepatitis A infection, mild adverse events, and serious adverse events. Outcome measures included in the evidence profile were one benefit outcome, hepatitis A infection, which we designated to be of critical importance, two harm outcomes, which included mild adverse events designated as important and serious adverse events designated as critical. For evidence retrieval, we conducted a systematic review of data on hepatitis A vaccine and persons living with HIV, including a search of Medline, Embase, Sinil, Cochrane Library, and cl clinicaltrials.gov through January 17, 2019. Our search terms are listed here on the slide. We did not restrict articles based on language or country of origin. We excluded studies based on the following criteria. Articles that focused solely on children or that did not have information on ages of included inv individuals. Articles with no data on Havrix or Vacta, which are the two single antigen hepatitis A vaccines currently licensed in the United States. Articles that did not provide new data, only included safety data not in our target population of persons living with HIV infection, discussed vaccine introduction, made recommendations, or proposed guidelines. Articles that could not be obtained full text or in English, articles on animals other than humans, and clinical trials with no results available. We identified 927 unique abstracts. 584 abstracts were excluded due to irrelevance, leaving 343 articles for full text review. We eliminated another 319 articles due to irrelevance or publication prior to 1996, which was when hepatitis A vaccine was first introduced in the United States. We also excluded st studies with populations that were a subset of other included studies. We included a total of 24 studies in our final grade analysis. The next several slides will designate studies as either as a randomized controlled trial or an observational study. This slide shows reference values and corresponding units used throughout the presentation. For hepatitis A vaccine, the correlative protection is generally accepted to be 20 milli international units per milliliter, but this varies from 10 to 33 in the literature. There are two monovalent hepatitis A vaccines licensed for adults in the US. The dosage for Vacta is 50 units, and the dosage for Havrix is 1,440 ELISA units. For the CD4 cell count, the normal range is 500 to 1,500 cells per millimeter cubed, and less than 200 cells per millimeter cubed indicates severely immunocompromised. For HIV viral load, undetectable is defined as RNA less than 20 to 75 copies per milliliter, depending on the assay used. Grade of evidence for hepatitis A vaccines and HIV infected benefits will be described next. The next several slides outline studies we assess for outcome number one, hepatitis A infection. These studies varied in how data was collected and reported. Note that thresholds for seroconversion also varied by study. The studies assessed are summarized here for reference on the slides and I will highlight key findings. The Kemper 2003 study demonstrated that seroconversion was 68% among those with CD4 counts greater than or equal to 200 and 9% among those with CD4 less than 200. This finding was significant. Lonnie 2008, a study from France, found in their intention to treat analysis, seroconversion was 69.4% among the two-dose group and 82.6% among the three-dose group. Wallace 2004, a U.S. study, found an overall seroconversion of 94%, with 87% in the CD4 less than 300 group and 100% among the CD4 greater than or equal to 300 group. Armstrong 2010, a U.S. study, found a seroconversion rate of 60% overall, with 62% among those with a CD4 greater than 400 and 55.56 among those with less than or equal to 400. Chang 2017, a study from Taiwan, found a seroconversion rate at month 12 of the study of 87.3% and 88.9% among those receiving a two-dose and three-dose respectively. Crum Chiaflone 2011, a U.S. study, found an overall CR conversion of 89%, with 78% among those with a CD4 less than 350, and 94% among those with a CD4 greater than or equal to 350. Horster 2010, a German study, 
found a CR conversion rate of 63.6%. Jablonowski 2014, a study from Poland, found a seroconversion rate of 79.5% after the second dose and an immunogenicity of 75.5% five years after vaccination. Jimenez 2013, a U.S. study, determined an overall seroconversion rate of 53.5% with 54% in the Havrics group. Cork County 2012, a study from Greece, found a serial conversion rate of 74.4%. Cork County 2013 and 2014 found serial conversion rates of 77 and 76% respectively. Lynn 2018, a study from Taiwan, determined a serial conversion rate of 63.8% in their intention to treat analysis and 93.7% in their per protocol analysis. This study found an overall vaccine effectiveness of 96.3%. MENA 2013, a study from Spain, found an overall CR conversion of 73.4% with 80.7% in the Havrics group. Over 10 2007, a U.S. study found a rate of 49.6% overall. Sakharidou 2017, a study from Greece, found 80.7% CR conversion within three months of hepatitis A series completion. Seng 2013, a study from Taiwan found a 75.7% serum conversion rate among those receiving a two-dose vaccination. Weinberg 2012, a U.S. study, found a 52% serum conversion rate in those who were HIV serum naive and received vaccine. Wiseman 2006, a U.S. study, determined a serum conversion of 48.5%. Rumland 2005, a U.S. study, found a rate of 60.7%. Valdez 2003, a U.S. study, found a rate of 88% among heart-only recipients. Lederman 2003, a U.S. study, found a serum conversion rate of 46%. Grade of evidence for hepatitis A vaccine in HIV-infected harms will be described next. This slide shows studies assessed for outcome number two, mild adverse events. Kemper 2003 found that 1.16 of all subjects experienced severe fatigue and 1.16 of the vaccine group experienced severe fatigue within four days of vaccination. Minor injection site soreness was found after 35% of vaccine doses were administered versus 8% of placebo doses administered. This study also found that reported post-vaccination in bacterial, viral, and fungal infections was 24% versus 26% among patients receiving vaccine versus placebo, respectively. Wallace 2004 reported a local reaction at the injection site in 57% of the vaccine group versus 60% of the placebo group. Systemic adverse events were predominantly headache and fever. Sang 2013 reported a mild tenderness at the injection site in 50. 1.6% of all subjects within 24 hours of vaccination. This slide shows outcomes assessed for outcome number three, serious adverse events. Castor 2009, a randomized controlled trial from Spain, found that vaccinations in successfully treated persons living with HIV were safe, not associated with increased de detectable viral load, and not associated with developing genotypic resistance mutations. Horster 2010, a study from Germany, found that there were no adverse reactions after vaccination for those receiving hepatitis A vaccination. No statistically significant difference between pre- and post-vaccination CD4 T-cell counts and HIV plasma viral load was observed in this study. Lonay 2008 found that there were no serious adverse events associated with vaccine, and there were no significant changes in CD4 T-cell counts or plasma HIV RNA levels. Bodsworth 1997 found no adverse outcomes attributable to vaccine. They also noted that there were no significant differences between case and controls for progression to AIDS, death, or mean CD4 cell decline. Wallace 2004 determined that vaccination had no adverse effect on CD4 cell count or HIV viral load. The grade summary will be described next. The evidence types are displayed here for reference, with one describing high quality of evidence and four describing very low quality of evidence. Okay. 
The limitations of the articles described include there were four, there were limited studies that directly compared a standard two dose vaccination versus no vaccination in adults who were HIV positive. There were limited studies with hepatitis A infection as a study endpoint, and zero conversion thresholds for hepatitis A antibodies, and timing of testing after vaccination varied by study. This is the grade summary. The benefit outcome, hepatitis A infection, for randomized controlled trials was graded as an evidence type 2. We downgraded for inconsistency due to variability of hepatitis A antibody seroconversion thres thresholds used. The benefit outcome, hepatitis A infection, for observational studies was graded as an evidence type 4. We downgraded for inconsistency due to variability of hepatitis A seroconversion thresholds used and for indirectness due to limited studies comparing a two-dose standard intervention to no vaccine. The harm outcome, mild adverse events for randomized control trials was graded as an evidence type 1. The harm outcome, mild adverse events for observational studies was graded as an evidence type 3. The harm outcome, serious adverse events for randomized controlled trials was graded as an evidence, evidence type 3. We downgraded indirectness for use of multiple non-hepatitis A vaccines and for impreci imprecision due to small study sample size. The harm outcome, serious adverse events for observational studies was graded as an evidence type 4. We downgraded indirectness for use of multiple non-hepatitis A vaccines and for imprecision also due to small sample size. Our references are listed here. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues for their support on this work. Thank you. And next, Mark will be pre presenting on the evidence for recommendation framework. Thank you, Alia. For the ETR framework, I will review the policy question, background, go through each of the 10 criteria, other considerations, and balance of consequences and ACIP recommendations. Should routine two-dose vaccination versus no routine vaccination to prevent hep a, hepatitis A be given to HIV-positive adults regardless of another indication for vaccination? Please note for the rest of this presentation, although the question refers to two doses, routine vaccination can also consist of a three-dose schedule when combined hepatitis A and B vaccine or twin RICs is administered. Data suggests up to 87% of persons living with HIV are susceptible to hepatitis A. Of newly diagnosed persons living with HIV, 75% are at risk for hepatitis A. MMP shows that up to 40% of persons living with HIV had no indication for hepatitis A vaccination. Of hepatitis A cases that did report risk factors, 56.2% indicated no risk factors for hepatitis A. Of note, nearly half of these hepatitis A cases were missing data on risk factors for hepatitis A. Criteria one, is this problem a public health priority? The work group judged yes, based on the following evidence. Persons living with HIV are at increased risk of hepatitis A virus infection because of a combination of first, their immunocompromised state, and second, missed opportunities for vaccination. Outbreaks that include persons living with HIV can have prolonged hepatitis A virus transmission. Hepatitis A viremia in persons living with HIV tend to be higher and more durable. IDSA and 11 other review articles recommend or permissively recommend vaccinating all HIV positive persons. Spain, Italy, and Australia report routinely vaccinating all persons living with HIV, at least in some parts of those countries. Susceptibility in the HIV positive population is high even among those with recommended risk factors for hepatitis A vaccination. On the x-axis are several publications reporting on the HIV positive population. On the y-axis are percentages of HIV positive patients in those studies who were non-immune to hepatitis A. 87% of high-risk patients at a New York HIV clinic, 58% at a Baltimore HIV clinic, 42% from the Medical Monitoring Project, and 31% of active HIV clinic patients at Washington University. Where available, the characteristics of the HIV positive population non-immune to hepatitis A are described. They are non-immune to hepatitis A virus infection despite existing risk factors for, hepatitis, for hep A vaccination. Criteria two, how substantial are the desirable anticipated effects? The work group judged large because hepatitis A virus infection may increase HIV replication potentially increasing HIV transmission. 
Hepatitis A virus infection in persons living with HIV is prolonged and can lead to longer transmission period. Also, it is known that Hep A vaccine is highly effective in the general population, and seroconversion rates in the HIV positive population are 49.6 to 96% from a 2015 published review. From Ollie's prior presentation, you see a similar range. Criteria three, how substantial are the undesirable anticipated effects? Minimal, Hep A vaccine is safe. The main side effect is mild, transient local soreness at the injection site. That's from follow-up of hundreds of millions of doses after 104 clinical studies in 27 countries. There are similar rates of serious adverse events in HIV positive versus HIV negative persons with no unexpected vaccine adverse events reported among persons living with HIV. Furthermore, Hep A vaccine does not increase HIV viral load, CD4 count, or progression to AIDS. Criteria four, do the desirable effects outweigh the undesirable effects? Yes. Protection against hepatitis A virus infection in persons living with HIV can be achieved despite lower seroconversion rates in persons living with HIV compared to persons without HIV. Out of 130 persons living with HIV, 85% maintain seropositivity six to 10 years after a two-dose vaccine series. However, vaccinating at higher CD4 counts is associated with better vaccine-induced immune response, which supports vaccinating persons living with HIV earlier in the course of HIV diagnosis. Ali had just presented the grade detailed assessment of the certainty of evidence. Criteria six, does the target population feel that the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects? Few have studied preferences of persons living with HIV regarding hepatitis A, but we have consulted expert opinion and select advocacy groups um, and ACIP workgroup members who work clinically with the HIV population to arrive at the judgment, probably yes. Qualitatively, frequent reasons for non-vaccination in one study were lack of recommendation by providers, lack of expected effectiveness, and fear of an vaccine adverse effect. Criteria seven, is there variability in how much people value main outcomes? There are a few studies specific to persons living with HIV on valuing protection against hepatitis A virus infection, but we likewise consulted expert clinical opinion to arrive at the judgment, probably no. Among the sample of persons who use injection drugs, of which 24.2% were persons living with HIV, convenience was an important determining factor for initiating Hep A, Hep B vaccination. Criteria eight, is the option acceptable to stakeholders? The work group said yes. There are parallels to the recommendations for hepatitis B vaccination in persons living with HIV. Sero response is lower also with Hep B vaccination for those with low CD4 counts, but it's still recommended that all persons living with HIV receive their first dose of Hep B vaccine during their first HIV care visit. Even though the vaccine is less immunogenic at lower CD4 counts, people at any CD4 count can and have responded. Routine Hep A vaccination would be less confusing to clinicians than having a different approach for the two types of vaccinations. Criteria nine. Is it a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources? Probably yes. Adult Hep A vaccine is licensed only for certain high-risk groups and cost-effectiveness data on its use for these indications are limited. We do know that outbreak campaigns incur high medical cost, productivity losses, disruption of other public health services and diversion of public health resources and extensive human resources. For instance, cost of a hepatitis A outbreak among persons who inject drugs of about 590 people in Washington state, $3.3 million. Cost of outbreak among MSM, 136 people, Ohio, half a million dollars. So cost of routine immunization through HIV and primary care clinics may be lower per capita than the cost of large rapid vaccination campaigns for outbreak response. Criteria 10, is the option feasible to implement? Probably yes. Simplifying provider guidance might improve protection of at-risk persons living with HIV. Vaccine response improves if persons living with HIV are vaccinated early in the course of HIV infection 
when they have higher initial CD4 counts and lower HIV viral load. Despite recommendations to vaccinate based on specific risk factors, there's inadequate screening and vaccination for hepatitis A among persons living with HIV, even in HIV clinics like Ryan White clinics. In a US study, only 23.3% eligible outpatient persons living with HIV received one dose of hep A vaccine. In a British study, hep A vaccine was indicated in 75% of persons living with HIV, but had been delivered to only 36% of eligible individuals. Other considerations, persons living with HIV may experience a milder clinical course of hepatitis A virus infection because of a less immune response and liver injury, but infection is prolonged and can lead to a longer transmission period. Early small case series indicated persons living with HIV who became infected with hepatitis A virus developed increased HIV viral load, increased liver enzyme levels, and significant declines in CD4 after pausing antiretroviral therapy. Some of these small studies showed HIV viral load increased in 38% of persons living with HIV with hepatitis A virus infection, and delayed resolution indicated by ALT remaining over five times the normal limit for over two weeks after diagnosis of hepatitis A virus infection. Larger recent studies showed less severe, but a prolonged course of hepatitis A virus infection. Host immune response may be the main pathogenic mechanism of liver injury in hepatitis A. These were the work group considerations. Factors favoring vaccination of persons living with HIV. Hepatitis A virus may increase HIV replication, potentially increasing HIV transmission. Resolution of hepatitis A virus infection may be delayed, potentially prolonging the infectious period. Up to 40% of persons living with HIV do not have a risk factor for which hep A vaccine is otherwise recommended. For persons living with HIV with an existing risk factor for hep A vaccination, another opportunity for vaccination would be provided for persons living with HIV who are missed or who do not seek services for other factors, other risk factors. Finally, vaccine is safe and efficacious in persons living with HIV. Factors not favoring vaccination of persons living with HIV. Illness from hepatitis A virus infection may be less severe. Seroconversion may be lower or take longer among persons living with HIV vaccinated while they have low CD4 counts. Immunity may wane in persons living with HIV who have low CD4 counts. An HIV infection alone is not a risk factor for hepatitis A virus infection. In the balance of consequences, desirable consequences probably outweigh undesirable consequences in most settings. The work group does recommend that routine two-dose vaccination versus no routine vaccination to prevent hepatitis A be given to adults, persons with HIV, regardless of another indication for vaccination. Future considerations for if hepatitis A vaccination is recommended for persons living with HIV. Consider additional protection with immunoglobulin and or additional vaccine following a known high-risk exposure regardless of vaccination history. Consider periodic anti-hepatitis A virus antibody testing and or booster doses for persons with an ongoing risk for exposure as with hepatitis B. And evaluate on data on vaccine effectiveness among persons living with HIV. Proximity of vaccination to HIV diagnosis and CD4 count at vaccination and at exposure to hepatitis A virus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Nelson would like to make a few comments before we open it up for questions. Uh, Hello. Um, Just to put things in perspective, we're talking about one million persons about living with with HIV. Um, Up to 40% of those persons um, do not have an existing um, risk factor for which hepatitis A vaccine is currently um, recommended. Therefore, we're talking about up to 400,000 people um, in addition that would be um, recommended to receive hepatitis A vaccine. Thank you for that. Any questions or comments from the voting members? Dr. Bernstein. Um, would uh, 
there be, although the recommendation is to give it in 400,000 uh, potential, would there be value in suggesting what their numbers are before they receive the vaccine? Uh, uh, that we would want it to be over 400, over 500, or, or doesn't matter, irrespective of their CD4 counts? I, I wasn't sure about that. Sure. If we were going to recommend it, would there be specific lab criteria that we would suggest? So that would be the, the next steps for, for work group discussion. Um, the, um, I would say that we would vaccinate at any CD4 count. However, persons that were vaccinated with a lower, let's say than 400, 200, whatever the cutoff might be, would require um, greater monitoring, p perhaps um, post-vaccination testing and, and boosters as is done for hepatitis B vaccination. Could I make a comment about that? That also means that if, if we make this recommendation, then at first contact, with the healthcare provider, we, this would be a, 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 an option or a, a, something that we would do just like we do for hepatitis B. So it would go into effect immediately. And so that the newer, po newer populations would be immunized very early on rather than waiting for a very low small CD4 count if we can catch them early. Any other, uh, Dr. Stevens, excuse me. So that was also my comment about CD4 count. Uh, it, it, we do see on introduction, unfortunately, CD4s of less than 200, uh, eight or nine percent response rate to the vaccine, at least in one of the two studies that was presented, is disturbing. And I, I think the the point is we should make sure that those individuals ultimately, as they're on retroviral antiretroviral therapy. Uh, look at uh, their response because I think it'll be low as the CD4 count is is lower. And, uh, Dr. Freyhoff, I, I, I support the Sorry. recommendation. Good. Uh, Sandra Fryho for American Medical Association. Um, I saw the levels of 20 for antibody titers, and um, in the past uh, with my patients, I have from time to time checked um, a qualitative, but the um, I've never checked a quantitative uh, antibody titer. Is, did that come up in, in your review? Uh, is that something we should be checking to make sure patients are immune? Or is it sort of like Hep B that the antibody titer goes down, but they're probably still, um, the, the vaccine's still working? So currently we um, don't recommend post-vaccination testing usually. Um, the, um, we do think that there is probably some waning um, antibody as opposed to immunity, um, but this has been looked at a lot more closely in terms of hepatitis B. Yeah. Dr. Edmar. I, I, my understanding was that the qualitative test is uh, relatively less sensitive, so the threshold for it being called positive is somewhat higher than these quantitative assays that have been described in the studies. Um, so I think, you know, if they're seronegative by, seropositive by qualitative tests, they're likely to be above the threshold is the way I've understood it. Um, but if they're seronegative, then, uh, you know, I think it's uncertain. But uh, I, I just want to um, uh, echo the comment about the CD4 count, because all of those studies that were shown really the only one that had a threshold of 200 showed uh, a, a poor, yeah, 9% uh, uh, seroconversion rate. And in fact, you know, biologically, I mean, 200 has really a, a been a pretty important number. Uh, and so I, I would want the work group to strongly consider um, recommendations with that in mind. Dr. Lee. I had uh, uh, more general um, observations, I guess. One is, um, thank you so much for going through the grade and the evidence to recommendation framework. One thing I just want to maybe call out for all of us is I'm, I'm realizing that the question about public health burden is interpreted somewhat differently by different work groups. And so perhaps something for us to consider how to um, consistently think about uh, both overall population burden as well as transmissibility um, and whether or not we need to consider individual health benefits as well. Um, the second question I had, um, honestly, it was, 
So I understand why perhaps there isn't a need for a formal cost effectiveness analysis, but I think it would be helpful just to get a sense of what is the estimated cost of vaccinating the population at hand, which is a smaller number of people, and also just back of the envelope calculations on what is the disease burden averted and uh, you know the economic burden averted. I don't think it has to be formal. Yeah, I have to admit I was thinking the same thing. Um, let us think about what that would look like so that we're not holding different groups to different standards and maybe work with the economics work group to sort of figure out what the what a light version would look like. Ms. Hayes. Carol Hayes, the American College of Nurse Midwives. Dr. Wang, I would be curious how your data breaks down by gender. Um, the risk factor for hepatitis A is um, different in men who have sex with men than it is for women. So how many of the people that were in your, I think it's slide 25 on your first presentation, but it has risk factors for um, which hepatitis A vaccination is recommended. I would love to see that data broken down by gender. Um, thank you. I don't have the number off the top of my head. I don't know. John, do we have, is that available at all? It's available. We haven't looked at it. Thank you. Thus far. Thanks. Do you think you guys could bring that uh, to, for the next meeting? Definitely. Dr. Moore. Thank you. Thanks for everyone's uh, comments. Just a couple of comments in terms of work group considerations, especially you know, Dr. Atmar and Dr. Stevens' comments around timing and CD4 count. I think we want to look at that. As far as the ACIP's recommendation to offer it or not, I don't know whether that goes into our vote or if it's part of the additional clinical guidance that CDC would provide more detail on. But we want also cognizant of the fact that we wanted to try to harmonize or look at if it's appropriate to harmonize with how hepatitis B is handled mm -hmm. in this population for whom hep B vaccine is also already recommended because there is a combination product that contains both in a single injection that is uh, that is an option. So we'll look at those things and see what we come back with on that. But those were some of our thoughts early on. And the other uh, comment on the economic analysis, I, I, although uh, economics is always important to consider, um, it's very difficult to do with a disease that is um, outbreak driven as opposed, it, it, it's not, sort of at a steady state with a steady state of exposure risk. Right now we're experiencing this huge multi-state outbreak and certain communities are at increased risk of exposure right now. Um, but it's a little, that's why we presented outbreak costs as opposed to other sort of general population costs the way we would with a disease that has a more steady state uh, presentation. So it's, it's challenging, but that's why we focused on the costs of outbreak response. Dr. Smith. Though I'm here representing ASTO, I'm also going to speak as an HIV care provider. Uh, this would be very welcome. Uh, many of our HIV patients actually do have already defined risk factors, but they are not, uh, because they're stigmatized conditions, they're oftentimes not, not identified until much later. Um, in our state uh, HIV surveillance data, for the most recent year, the largest category for risk factor is always unknown because it takes a while oftentimes to identify these risk factors. Um, also, uh, uh, these are folks that uh, oftentimes actually do have a payment source for their immunization uh, through the Ryan White program, and uh, it's a way to get a, a relatively higher risk group for hepatitis A immunized, because uh, there's part of a, a system of care there for them. And then uh, finally, in terms of timing and CD4 counts, you know, this is an issue that we have to deal with with a lot of, a, a lot of different immunizations, you know, pneumococcal vaccine, meningococcal vaccine, hepatitis B, et cetera. And oftentimes there is a, a clinical judgment in terms of when to give those. If there are compelling reasons to give them right away when the CD4 count is low, you know, they're given sometimes, there's a delay as therapy um, is given for their HIV and the CD4 count comes up. And that usually happens fairly rapidly, so. Dr. Talbot. So I quickly looked at the adult immunization schedule to see if HIV had their own column, because that would make sense to me, because then you could look through. But then it's already purple, which means it should be considered. Does that mean it should be considered but not paid for at this moment? And I guess that's my, hold on. And then my second part of that question is, um, Hep B is, is yellow, which is indicated. And it would be great to see what the vaccination rate is, the HIV positives or Hep B, to see if actually 
changing that color from purple to yellow will move that bar in the intended direction. So I can answer the first part. The, the purple for the adult immunization schedule on the high risk table means that if they have another indication, it's not contraindicated. So they can get it if they have another indication, but it, it doesn't mean they should be considered because of the indication that it's in the column. Uh, no. You know, I, I mean, I think we're immunization people. One of the things that I don't exactly know, which we have, but we just commit to figuring out for next time, is what the um, specifics are in terms of reimbursement, in terms of the yeah. Ryan folks that are covered by Ryan White. Because, but from an immunization standpoint, if it's on the schedule, it's covered. Right regardless of where it is on the schedule. Well, no, but the purple in not no, it's in the, on the schedule as a recommended vaccine. Right, but it's but that color that you're talking about in that table is not a recommendation. If that's clear. But that's for our we should for those, figure out right. yeah, for those out risk people. Yeah. Um, and then Noel, do you have any comments about H hepatitis B coverage in people with HIV? The second part of the question. We will look at that for next time. I believe Dr. Hunter wanted to say something. Dr. No? Okay. Dr. Moore? I can say from the uh, state of Tennessee that there's a, a lot of quality metrics related to that. And Dr. Carolyn Wester, who's now the CDC's new division of viral hepatitis director, she's unable to be here today, but she was my counterpart there. And she always insisted it was a high quality of, a, a quality of care indicator that was monitored at the state level for all HIV patients. So hepatitis B vaccine completion was very high among HIV patients because they're tracked and, and cared for a little better than uh, others with other risk factors. Any other comments? All right. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the final uh, topic, uh, which is vaccine supply. Dr. Santoli. Hi there. I will be quick. <laughs> um, vaccine supply update. And I'm just going to cover hepatitis B, um, both adult and pediatric, and then remind you of where you can find this information on our webpage. So first with adult, um, Merck is not currently distributing its adult hepatitis B vaccine or the dialysis formulation, and will not be distributing that vaccine through 2019. Um, however, together, GSK and Dynafax have sufficient supply of adult hepatitis B vaccine to address the anticipated gap in supply. Um, this is not changed from the last time that I provided you with an update on adult hepatitis B vaccine in October. For pediatric hepatitis B vaccine, Merck supply of pediatric hepatitis B vaccines have been constrained since mid-2017, and Merck will continue to direct its limited supply to CDC to support utilization consistent with current clinical guidance. They expect to have a limited supply of the monovalent hepatitis B vaccine for pediatric use through 2019. And this is different from the October update when we talked about the middle of 2019, so this is now through the, the full calendar year. GSK is able to continue to cover the supply gap through 2019 with a combination of their monovalent and combination vaccine. However, preference for a specific presentation may not be met uniformly during this time period. And then the other important note is that the supply of monovalent vaccine remains sufficient, more than sufficient, to cover the birth dose for all children, as well as to provide some second and third doses. And that is the update on hepatitis B vaccine. And then here is a reminder of where we keep this information up to date for you and the public and providers and others for whom it might be helpful. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Are there any comments, questions from the voting members? If not, then I remind you that our next meeting is June 26 and 27 of this year. Thank you for attending this meeting. I close the sessions. <laughs>